Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. We've been looking at the weaknesses of real numbers. A lot of you will be wondering, which way should I go personally? Should I believe Norman? Should I go with the majority? How do I tell whether what is being presented here is actually correct or not? Well, I hope that there is some internal logic to what I'm saying, that what I'm saying sounds reasonable and that you can understand the logic and the, the reasons for what I'm trying to convince you of. But in addition, we could say, well, how can we sort of decide whether the current theory of real numbers really works, aside from just listening to Norman? Well, one possible answer is that we can look at standard textbooks and see if their treatments hold up. In fact, we have an obligation to do this. We have an obligation to have a look at how standard textbooks tackle the difficulties. And can they actually surmount the difficulties? Can they present a proper theory of real numbers that's convincing and complete? If they can, well, then I should retract my position and we can all go back to the happy situation that we had previously. So in today's video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some textbooks, some calculus textbooks and some analysis textbooks. And these are all taken from my personal library. So I have lots of books, and in particular I have books on calculus, classical texts, and I have books on analysis. And we're going to have a look at some of these texts. And I would like to emphasize that even though we are going to be pointing out weaknesses and deficiencies in these books, I don't want this to be taken as a personal attack on the authors of these books. All of the books that I'm presenting to you here are, in my opinion, very good books. Okay, they have a lot to recommend them. It's not that they, in particular, have logical weaknesses with regard to real numbers. What I claim is that this logical weakness is essentially uniform across the entire discipline. It wouldn't matter which books I presented to you, we would all find the similar kind of situation. So the fact that I'm going to show you a book already means that I hold it in high esteem. If I don't respect this book, I'm not even going to show it to you. All right? So let's have a look at some books. And they're not selective. I'm not interested in cherry picking the examples that support my thesis and ignoring the ones that don't. We'll see that in fact there are some books that really try to tackle this issue. And the question of whether they're successful or not will be a very interesting and important one. All right, so we're going to roll up the sleeves, we're going to open the books, we're going to see how does modern mathematics actually in practice deal with the issue of real numbers. All right, so here are the first books that we're going to have a look at. We're going to start with the book Calculus by James Stewart. And this is one of the most successful calculus textbooks of all time. Okay, so let's have a look to see what Stuart does in terms of introducing the real numbers. All right, so the first thing we can do is we can look at uh, the table of contents and we look to see whether there's a section on real numbers or, you know, basic orientation to the foundations. And the first chapter is on functions and models, and then limits and rates of change, derivatives, and so on. If we look through, we don't actually see directly any section that deals with uh, real numbers. Okay, but wait a minute. At the end, in the appendix, A2, we can see something that's in this direction. So let's have a look at the appendix. All right, so appendix A. Uh, called Intervals, Inequalities, and Absolute Values, starts talking about number systems. Okay, I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'm going to give you the basic idea. So calculus is based on the real number system, is the first statement. We start with the integers, then we construct the rational numbers, and I'm skipping sections, and then it says some real numbers, such as root 2, can't be expressed as a ratio of integers and are therefore called irrational numbers. 
It can be shown with varying degrees of difficulty that the following are also irrational numbers. Square root of 3, square root of 5, cube root of 2, pi, sine of 1, log of 2. The set of all real numbers is usually denoted by the symbol r. When we use the word number without qualification, we mean real number. And then he talks about decimal representations, that every number has a decimal representation. And he talks about repeating decimals and unrepeating or non-repeating decimals in the case of, say, root 2 or pi. He talks a little bit about the real numbers can be represented by points on a line and coordinates, real number line. He states that the real numbers are ordered. And then there's a discussion of sets. Right. So the long and short of it, that is everything is appearing on this uh, one page, essentially. We have a quick introduction of rational numbers. And then the real numbers are basically just assumed to exist. There's no real attempt to define what a real number is. So we're going to have to say that Stuart does not attempt to define the real numbers. And so the, the definition certainly is not satisfactory. Let's move to the calculus textbook called Calculus by Salas, Hilla, and Etkin, which is the uh, textbook that we here at the University of New South Wales have used for many years. All right, so I quoted a little bit about this on my recent debate with Jim Franklin. I'll do that again. So here the real numbers are introduced on in the first chapter on page four. There's a section called Real Numbers. Okay, what does it say? Our study of calculus is based on the real number system. The real number system consists of the set of real numbers together with the familiar arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and certain other properties which are reviewed briefly here. And then there's a list of types of numbers, natural numbers, integers, some rational numbers, irrational numbers, examples, root 2, cubed root of 7, pi, the solutions of the equation x squared minus 5 equals 0. And then there's discussion of the decimal representations of numbers, either being repeating or non-repeating, and the geometric representation on a line, and the various order properties. So there's no attempt at actually defining what a real number is. So clearly these authors, along with Stuart, are assuming that the reader basically already understands what real numbers are. So we're going to have to say that no, real numbers are not defined, and certainly this definition is not satisfactory. How about a look at the uh, recent textbook of Rogowski, quite a nice book called Calculus. And let's have a look to see how John Rogowski approaches things. Well, he certainly starts off uh, directly uh, talking about this issue. So on the first page, pre-calculus review. This is the review. So I say he starts saying, calculus builds on the foundation of algebra, analytic geometry, and trigonometry. In this chapter, therefore, we review some concepts, facts, and formulas from pre-calculus that are used throughout the text. The first section is real numbers, functions, and graphs. We begin with a short discussion of real numbers. This gives us the opportunity to recall some basic properties in standard notation. So a real number is a number represented by a decimal or decimal expansion. He has real number in bold here, so this is his definition of what a real number is. It's a number represented by a decimal or decimal expansion in quotes. There are three types of decimal expansions, finite, repeating, and infinite but non-repeating. For example, and then the non-repeating one is pi. The set of all real numbers is denoted by a boldface r. Um, a no real number is called rational if it can be represented by p over q. We can tell whether a number is rational from its decimal expansion. And then we have the uh, talk about the absolute value and we go on to order properties and intervals. Is this really a definition of real numbers? Well, he has got real number in bold, and he has said that it's going to be a, a decimal or decimal expansion. So I think we sh can say that, yes, he has made an attempt, perhaps not very convincing, but he has made an attempt to define real numbers. 
Is this definition satisfactory? Certainly it's not. No attempt has been made to tell us what kind of infinite decimals are allowed, whether we're talking about choice or algorithms. No mention has been made of the arithmetic of real numbers and how we may establish the laws of arithmetic. And in particular, the various problems that I talked about when we're talking about infinite decimals are completely ignored. So the definition is certainly not satisfactory. Let's go back in time. Maybe earlier generations were more careful or concerned with the issue. Let's have a look at important book, Differential and Integral Calculus by Courant. This is 1934. There it is, Differential and Integral Calculus. Not quite as glossy with as many pictures, but still a good book. All right, so on chapter one, introduction, I, uh, he starts in section one with the continuum of numbers. The question as to the real nature of numbers is one which concerns philosophers more than mathematicians, and philosophers have been much occupied with it. Well, this is interesting. Let's read a little bit further. But mathematics must be carefully kept free from conflicting philosophical opinions. Preliminary study of the essential nature of the concept of number from the point of view of the theory of knowledge is fortunately not required by the student of mathematics. We shall therefore take the numbers, and in the first place the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, etc., as given, and we shall likewise take as given the rules by which we calculate these numbers. All right. And then he talks about the system of rational numbers and the need for its extension. All right, so this is quite a discussion of rational numbers and the familiar story of this number root 2, which is not a rational number, and he gives an argument for that. All right, so then he says, the above reasoning, which is a characteristic example of an indirect proof, shows that the symbol root 2 cannot correspond to any rational number. Thus we see that if we insist that after choice of a unit interval, every point of the number axis shall have a number corresponding to it, we are forced to extend the domain of rational numbers by the introduction of new irrational numbers, irrational in quotes. This system of rational and irrational numbers such that each point on the axis corresponds to just one number, and each number corresponds to just one point on the axis, is called the system of real numbers. All right, now there's some attempt made at elaborating on what real numbers are. So this is good. He recognizes the importance of this issue, and he's now going to talk about real numbers. So our requirement that to each point of the axis there shall correspond one real number states nothing a priori about the possibility of calculating with these real numbers in the same way as with rational numbers. So he admits that it's not obvious how we're going to do arithmetic with these real numbers. We establish our right to do this by showing that our requirement is equivalent to the following fact. The totality of all real numbers is represented by the totality of all finite and infinite decimals. All right, so his idea is we are going to establish arithmetic by convincing ourselves that real numbers are basically infinite decimals. It's a very um, sensible thing to do, really, corresponding to what the scientists do. So we, then there's a discussion of uh, decimal number arithmetic. Okay, uh, there is no uh, mention of any sort of subtle issues that uh, are like the ones I talked about in the, when I was talking about the difficulties of infinite decimals as real numbers. But at some point he says that here we would emphasize the fundamental assumption that we can calculate in the usual way th with the real numbers and hence with the decimals. It is possible to prove this using only the properties of the integers as a starting point. But this is no light task. And rather than allow it to bar our progress at this early stage, we regard the fact that the ordinary rules of calculation apply to the real numbers as an axiom, on which we shall base the whole differential and integral calculus. Now what an important statement that is. Okay. So he's admitting that there is some issue about defining arithmetic and 
establishing the usual arithmetic for these real numbers or infinite decimals. And he also says that it's not easy and we're not going to do it. We're going to regard the fact that the ordinary rules of calculation apply to the real numbers as an axiom. In other words, it's going to be an assumption. And that's really the end of the story. So this is certainly more in the direction of trying to grasp this important issue, putting it out there, thinking a little bit more carefully about it. So he certainly tackled the idea of defining real numbers, basically by infinite decimals. But he has obviously not been able to actually lay out a systematic definition with clear theorems. And notably, he has left the existence of a valid arithmetic as an axiom or assumption. Our uh, next book is uh, one of my personal favorite uh, calculus books. It's one that I think is a beautiful book. It's been around quite a long time now, but still a classic. It's Calculus by Michael Spivak. And you can see it's uh, somewhat frayed. Uh, nature is testament to uh, the fact that I've thumbed through it quite a lot over the years. Beautiful book. Um, so this is a little bit more of an advanced book that it aims higher than most calculus books. It's more theoretical. It's more inclined towards uh, mathematics majors, potential future mathematicians. And uh, Spivak is also uh, quite concerned with logical structure. He's interested in proofs and, and th careful laying out of theorems uh, and quite a lot of interesting uh, problems as well. All right, so in chapter one, we see basic properties of numbers. And what he does in this first chapter is he lists properties of numbers, such as the associative law, distributive laws, etc. the familiar um, sort of properties, but he doesn't actually say what a number is. Okay, so it's quite a bit of uh, business here. All right, so he's listed these 12 properties of uh, numbers, and then uh, he says, what does he say? He says, it is still a crucial question whether these properties actually account for all properties of numbers. As a matter of fact, we shall soon see that they do not. In the next chapter, the deficiencies of properties P1 to P12 will become quite clear, but the proper means for correcting these deficiencies is not so easily discovered. The crucial additional basic property of numbers which we are seeking is profound and subtle, quite unlike P1 to P12. The discovery of this crucial property will require all the work of part two of this book. In the remainder of part one, we will begin to see why some additional properties required. In order to investigate this, we will have to consider a little more carefully what we mean by numbers. Okay, so this is all very good. Let's uh, have a look at the next chapter. The chapter two is called Numbers of Various Sorts. And here he starts talking about natural numbers, induction, various properties of number theoretical properties of uh, natural numbers, and okay, I think there is some mention of roots and so on, but um, not much more. All right, so he does mention somehow though that there's going to be a part two where it's going to be dealing more with these things. Ah, in fact, we see at the end, epilogue, there is a section on construction of the real numbers. Okay, which is uh, 494. So let's have a look at this appendix where we're going to get at real numbers. Okay, so construction of the real numbers, great. All right, so the mass of drudgery which this chapter necessarily contains is relieved by one truly first-rate idea. In order to prove that a complete ordered field exists, we will have to explicitly describe one in detail. And uh, then there's uh, a claim that verifying conditions 1 to 10 for an ordered field will be a straightforward ordeal, but the description of the field itself or the elements in it is ingenious indeed. Okay, so then he talks 
about the definition in this box. All right, so here's the definition of a real number. A real number is a set alpha of rational numbers with the following four properties. And then he lists some properties. If x is in alpha and y is a rational number with y less than x, then y is also in alpha. Alpha is not equal to the empty set. Alpha is not equal to uh, q. And there is no greatest element in a. In other words, if x is in a alpha, then there is some y in alpha with y greater than x. OK, so this is a definition which is uh, in the direction of a Dedekind cut, which we have not talked about. Okay? So we are going to talk about Dedekind cuts, and so we're going to flag uh, Spivak that uh, we're going to have to come back to Spivak and see, once we've discovered that, whether this definition of his stands up. But it's certainly clear at this stage that, yes, real numbers are defined, for sure. And whether the definition is satisfactory or not is, at this point, a question. We will have to go through it carefully to see. But notice also that it's actually in an appendix. So he's leaving this difficult question, the whole issue, uh, to the very end. All right. So there we have a first uh, glance at some textbooks. Let's have a look at some more. All right, so let's have a look at some more texts. I'm going to have a look at this book called An Introduction to Infinitesimal Calculus by G.W. Kant. And it's uh, a little bit older, 1914, so exactly 100 years ago. And uh, it's a book that covers functions and their graphs, limits, differentiations, various kind, basic integrations, and then uh, applications to, uh, well, various surface integrals, polar equations, centers of gravity, and so on, and up to elementary differential equations. So a somewhat practically uh, oriented calculus text. And let's have a look in the uh, table of contents if there, we can see something uh, where he's dealing with the nature of the continuum. All right, so I can't uh, see anything uh, here. Let's have a look just to see in the first few uh, pages. So he starts off in chapter one saying functions and their graphs, constants and variables in any equation or in any investigation. The quantities which occur are of two kinds. Those are certain ones called constants, which are generally denoted by the earlier letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, and so on. And those which take different values or, or variables, generally denoted by U, V, and X, Y, and so on. And, uh, okay. There's some mention of tans and logs and square roots. And he's um, talking about transcendental functions and algebraic functions. So I think he is working implicitly with real numbers, but he doesn't actually uh, spend any time telling us what real numbers are. And just to check, we'll go to the index at the back and have a look under R. And indeed, we don't see any entry under uh, real number. Um, so we can uh, kind of assume that this somewhat practically oriented uh, calculus text just uh, avoids the issue altogether. So certainly we'll have to say that uh, the real numbers are neither defined and certainly the definition is not satisfactory. All right, what about uh, the next book, which is a well-known book called Calculus by Tom Apostle. Okay, so this is a very uh, novel book and a very lovely book in many ways. And I have a lot of sympathy for this book because he starts with the integral calculus. A great place to start. And in fact, his part one is the method of Archimedes. He talks about how Archimedes and his uh, understanding of exhaustion, trying to calculate areas under a parabola, for example, is really a precursor um, to the calculus. Okay, that's all really good. And, uh, and then in the supplement to this introductory uh, chapter, we uh, find a set of axioms for the real number system. All right, so let's have a look at what he's saying. So he says, there are many ways to introduce the real number system. One popular method is to begin with the positive integers one, two, three, and use them as building blocks to construct a more comprehensive system having the properties desired. 
Uh, briefly, the idea is to take the positive integers as undefined concepts, state some axioms concerning them, and then use the positive integers to build a larger system consisting of the positive rational numbers. And then the positive rational numbers in turn may then be used as a basis for constructing the positive irrational numbers. Or in quotes, or in parentheses, real numbers like root 2 and pi that are not rational. The final step is the introduction of the negative real numbers in 0. And the most difficult part of the whole process is the transition from the rational numbers to the irrational numbers. All right, so he's identifying what we have to do. So is he going to do it? So although the need for irrational numbers was apparent to the ancient Greeks, it wasn't until the late 19th century they were introduced, and he mentions Weierstrass, Cantor, Dedekind, and the Italian mathematician Giuseppe Piano. And then a detailed account of this construction, beginning with the piano postulates and using the method of Dedekind to introduce irrational numbers, may be found in a book by E. Landau called Foundations of Analysis, written in 1951. So he makes reference to uh, construction of the real numbers. The point of view we shall adopt here is non-constructive. We shall start rather far out in the process taking the real numbers themselves as undefined objects, satisfying a number of properties that we use as axioms. That is to say, we shall assume there exist certain objects called real numbers, which satisfy the ten axioms listed in the next five sections. All the properties of real numbers that we shall use in this book are in this list or can be deduced from the axioms in, the, in this list. When the real numbers are defined by a constructive process, the properties we list as axioms must be proved as theorems. And then he goes on to state field axioms and order axioms and draw some consequences of that. So he's basically saying that the job of constructing the real numbers has been done somewhere else and he's not going to do it. He's just going to assume there are things called real numbers, I'm not going to tell you what they are, and he's going to assume that they have certain convenient properties that are going to be then the basis for further work. Okay. So logically, uh, this fails in my view uh, completely. Okay. There's neither a proper definition, and certainly uh, there's no definition, then just some axiomatic rolling out of what you'd like to be true certainly cannot be considered satisfactory. On the other hand, though, he does at least point towards another text by Landau called Foundations of Analysis that we probably will want to get a hold of at some point and have a look at. And he refers to the method of Dedekind, which we are going to be talking about uh, shortly. All right. Now let's turn to probably the uh, most important uh, textbook writer of the 20th century in mathematics, which was Murray uh, Spiegel, who was responsible for the uh, very popular uh, books on, called Sholmes Outline Books. Now these are very practically oriented books, loved by students for many, many decades, because they're very problem-oriented and practical, no-nonsense, and they keep the theory down to a uh, bare minimum. And so we're not going to expect a lot of theoretical treatment about real, real numbers are, even though it's called real variables. So it's about Lebesgue measure and integration. And let's just have a look to see what uh, Spiegel does. So in chapter one, he starts with fundamental concepts. Fair enough. Starts with sets, subsets. And on page two, we see real numbers. So let's see what he says. He says, one of the most important sets for the purposes of this book is the set R of real numbers. It is assumed that the student is already acquainted with many properties of real numbers from the calculus. This is a more a second year or third year sort of level uh, book. So anybody who's going to be studying this measure theory and integration and some more fancy integration, Lebesgue integrals, will already have to have had a prior calculus course. Uh, geometric intuition is often provided by using the fact that every real number can be represented by a point on a line called the real line. And then he talks about intervals. And uh, he mentions irrational numbers such as root 2, pi, cubed root of 5, and e are those real numbers which are not rational. So there's really uh, 
nothing in the way of a proper definition. He does mention an important property, which he calls the completeness or least upper bound axiom. And he says the following axiom distinguishes the real numbers from any of its proper subsets, for example, the rationals. And he mentions this least upper bound axiom. Okay, so it's clear that there's not a definition, and so from a logical point of view, it's certainly unsatisfactory, we'd have to say. And now let's have a look at this very interesting book uh, called Elementary Calculus by Jerome Kiesler. It's quite a novel book, this one, and uh, well worth having a look at because Kiesler takes the point of view of non-standard analysis. So he tries to set up calculus using infinitesimals, infinitesimals that Leibniz and Newton and, and Euler uh, all enjoyed using, um, and tries to uh, look at it, these infinitesimals from a rather modern point of view called non-standard analysis. All right, so let's have a look in his first chapter, which reads the real and hyperreal numbers. Right, we're not going to say much about hyperreal numbers, but let's have a look at what he says about real numbers. So our starting point in this course is the real number system, which is familiar from elementary algebra. Well, we shall use the letter R for the set of all real numbers. We think of the real numbers as arranged along a straight line with the integers marked off at equal intervals, and this line is called the real line. All right, so that's all very vague. Now he says, do not be fooled by the name real number, in quotes. The real number system is a purely mathematical creation which may or may not give an accurate picture of a straight line in physical space. And that's somewhat interesting. The fact is that while our senses give us a pretty good idea of what medium-sized line segments are like, we know very little about what very large or very small line segments in physical space are like. On the other hand, as far as we can tell, the real line is enough like a line in physical space for all practical purposes. So what is the real number system? One way to answer this question is to start with the positive integers and step by step construct the integers, the rational numbers, and the real numbers. Okay, this is a rather long process and is best left to a later course in mathematics. Instead, we shall answer the question in a quicker way by simply listing some properties of the real numbers. And these properties will be accepted as basic and will be called axioms. All other properties of real numbers which we shall need can be proved from the axioms. And then he does uh, the same kind of thing we've seen before, a list of axioms like commutative laws, associative laws, order axioms, Archimedean axiom. And there's our introduction to real numbers. So although this book is very interesting because it gives us a point of view of calculus that really goes back to the 18th century, or maybe 17th century, uh, using infinitesimals, it certainly doesn't step up to the plate when it comes to saying what real numbers really are. I hope you're starting to see a pattern here, right? This is a topic which is carefully avoided by people. For some reason, a self-evident, simple, clear explanation of what real numbers are and how you do arithmetic with them seems to be sort of missing. Hmm, I wonder why. Okay, the, the next book is Calculus of Several Variables by Robert Adams. Okay, here it is. It's a... Uh, Sort of an uh, elegant uh, little book on a second year level, so dealing with a multivariable calculus, uh, calculus of several variables, and it's uh, sort of geometrical. And if we look through the contents, let's have a look. Uh, we don't see anything that's obviously related to foundational issues, and there's a few appendices, but I can't see anything on, um, on definitions of real numbers. Okay, so there's a mention of Euclidean n space Rn, um, but it doesn't seem as if we're 
going to say anything about what the actual numbers involved there are. Let's just have a check at the uh, back, at the index, have a look under R, see if there's anything under real numbers, and there isn't. So I suppose that this approach here is that, well, they've already learned what real numbers are. There's no need for us to uh, say anything further about things. Okay? So this is a very common game that's played. The, uh, the introductory calculus text will say, oh, real numbers are too complicated. Uh, we can be done, but you'll do that in a later course. And then uh, when the later courses come around, the more advanced courses, they will often say, ah, oh, you already know what real numbers are. There's no need, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just uh, go on to more advanced things. So, again, yeah. the logical structure is clearly uh, lacking. So we're not doing too well in terms of actually finding out what real numbers are, how you do arithmetic with them, and how you prove the laws of arithmetic. All right, so our last uh, set of books are all in the direction of real analysis, and they are more advanced books. Typically a course uh, taken by math majors in a third year, a junior year uh, at university. Okay, so a first one called Mathematical Analysis by Apostle. This is the same Apostle that we had that calculus uh, book of. So this is a, uh, a more advanced uh, uh, book, which deals with uh, some points at topology, limits, derivatives, about um, Riemann Stilch's integrals, uh, infinite series and infinite product sequences, Lebesgue integral, Fourier series, um, multiple Riemann integral, multiple Lebesgue integral, and some complex analysis as well. Okay, so a more advanced uh, book. So let's have a look uh, in chapter one, which starts the real and complex number systems. All right, this is good, so we, uh, we're going to have a look. So introduction. Mathematical analysis studies concepts related in some way to real numbers. So we begin our study of analysis with a discussion of the real number system. That seems only right and proper. Several methods are used to introduce real numbers. One method starts with the positive integers as undefined concepts, uses to build them rational numbers. The rational numbers in turn are then used to construct the irrational numbers the rational and irrational numbers together constitute the real number system. Although these matters are an important part of the foundations of mathematics, they will not be described in detail here. As a matter of fact, in most phases of analysis, it is only the properties of real numbers that concern us, rather than the methods used to construct them. Therefore, we shall take the real numbers themselves as undefined objects, satisfying certain axioms from which further properties will be derived. Since the reader is probably familiar with most of the properties of real numbers discussed in the next few pages, the presentation will be rather brief. So I think this is uh, rather disappointing. Here we have a, a serious book that shrugs off this very foundational important uh, subject just with a few lines saying that, well, you already know a little bit about them and we're just going to be concerned with the properties of real numbers. We shall take the real numbers themselves as undefined objects, so we're not even going to address the issue of what the real numbers are defined to be. So I hope you're getting the idea here, right? If there really was a simple, proper way of introducing real numbers, okay, one that was clear and logical, for sure books like this would lay that theory out because it's absolutely foundational for the whole subject. So Apostle goes on to list the field axioms. So along with the set R of real numbers, we assume the existence of two operations called addition and multiplication. So we're not even going to define what those things are. And then we're going to assume that they obey the commutative laws, associative laws, distributive laws, and so on. So there's not going to be any proofs of all the major results. We're just going to assume everything. Okay, so I really think this is um, a serious abdication of a very important responsibility. And unfortunately, Apostle is not alone in this, uh, in this attitude. So we're certainly going to um, 
In this case, because it's a, a serious analysis book, we're not even going to um, give them the benefit of the doubt anymore. Okay, real numbers are not defined here. The definition is highly unsatisfactory. Let's go to real analysis by Royden. Okay, the book there. So we're talking about real analysis. Okay, so this is again a, a more advanced a topic dealing with Lebesgue integral, uh, classical Banach spaces, metric spaces, topological spaces, um, measure theory, integration theory, Daniel integral, measures, outer measures, topology, and uh, so more advanced topics. In the first chapter called set theory, let's have a look to see if we can find uh, anything. No, we can't, but in the second uh, chapter, in part one, we see a whole chapter called the real number system. All right, so this is good. Let's have a look to see how Royden introduces the real numbers. Page 29. Okay, a whole chapter on the real number system. Axioms for the real number system. We assume that the reader has a familiarity with the set R of real numbers and those basic properties of real numbers which are usually treated in an undergraduate course in analysis. The present chapter is devoted to a review and systematization of those results which will be useful later. Is he going to abdicate as well? It looks like it. Let's carry on. One approach to the subject of real numbers is to define them as dedicant cuts of rational numbers. The rational numbers in turn being defined in terms of the natural numbers. Such a program gives an elegant construction of the real numbers out of more primitive concepts and set theory. We shall not concern ourselves here with the construction of the real numbers, but will think of them as already given and list a set of axioms for them. All the properties we need are consequences of these axioms, and in fact these axioms completely characterize the real numbers. So it's exactly the same kind of um, uh, inadequate foundation as we saw in Apostle. And then there's a list of field axioms completeness axioms, order axioms, and various consequences of them. So basically, we're not going to say what a real number is, and we're not going to prove any of the crucial properties. We're just going to assume that they exist and that those properties are given to us. Okay. We are not impressed. Let's have a look at introductory real analysis. Here is Introductory Real Analysis by Kolmogorov and Fomin. These are all very prominent analysts here. And these books have a lot to recommend them, as I've pointed out before. It's just that when it comes to the foundational aspects, they seriously fall short. But let's have a look at this one. So the topics and the contents are set theory, metric spaces, topological spaces, linear spaces, linear functionals, operators, integration, measure, differentiation. Okay, so let's have a look at the foundational aspects. So first, there's some stuff on sets, uh, equivalence of sets, yes, ordered sets and ordinal numbers. Ordinal numbers, well, maybe we've already gone past the, uh, uh, there's already some discussion of uh, s real numbers here, okay. Uncountability of real numbers, all right, let's have a look. Okay, so finite and infinite sets. All right, so under this section, there is a discussion of countable sets and with the integers uh, prominently discussed. And we have notion of equivalence, sets, fine. Uncountability of the real numbers. Okay, so Theorem 5, so this appears to be the first time that we see uh, real numbers. The set of real numbers in the closed unit interval is uncountable. Okay, I've just flipped through uh, the book and I have verified that I could not see any prior uh, definition of real numbers. So this is the first uh, serious mention of real numbers and it's talking about the set of real numbers in the closed unit interval is uncountable. And from the uh, description, it's clear that real numbers are going to be thought of in terms of infinite decimals. So it seems as if certainly there's no um, discussion of what a real number is. There's just an assumption that real numbers are infinite decimals. And uh, as far as the arithmetic 
uh, of such is concerned and any uh, discussion of the foundations, it seems to be uh, lacking. Let's just make sure and have a look at the, uh, the index for anything but real numbers and we don't see any uh, index entries on real numbers. So it seems as if uh, this is not even an issue uh, for the authors of this book. And the last book that I'm going to uh, look at is Principles of Mathematical Analysis by Rudin. Uh, Walter Rudin, another very nice book. All of these books are great books in many ways, all right? So don't get me wrong. It's just when it comes down to this issue, they necessarily have to waffle because they have no choice, right? There is no proper theory of real numbers. So there's no way that any of them can come up with a proper theory. They all have to find some way of circumventing their way around this huge elephant in the room. Okay, so Rudin also begins, first chapter, with a real and complex number system. All right, so let's start. An introduction. A satisfactory discussion of the main concepts of analysis must be based on an accurately defined number concept. All right, we agree wholeheartedly with that statement. We shall not, however, enter into any discussion of the axioms that govern the arithmetic of the integers, but assume familiarity with the rational numbers. All right, that's fair enough. I'm happy to buy that. The rational number system is inadequate for many purposes, both as a field and as an ordered set. Um, for instance, there is no rational p such that p squared equals 2. This leads to the introduction of so-called irrational numbers, which are often written as infinite decimal expansions and are considered to be approximated by corresponding decimals. All right. But unless the irrational number root 2 has been clearly defined, the question must arise, just what is it that this sequence tends to? Aha, so Rudin is going to address something here. He's going to, uh, he's noting that, all right, we have this sequence, 1, 1 1.4, 1.41, 1.414, but unless root 2 has actually been defined, there doesn't appear to be an obvious limit. So this sort of question can be answered as soon as the so-called real number system is constructed. All right, great. It would be good to have a construction of real numbers. All right, so then there's a little bit of discussion of ordered sets, uh, and then fields, and then definitions of uh, fields, and an ordered field, and now we come to the real field, okay? So now we can state the existence theorem, which is the core of this chapter. Theorem, there exists an ordered field R, which has the least upper bound property, and it contains the rational numbers as a subfield. Okay, so the least upper bound property, we're going to have to talk about that. That is one of the uh, fundamental properties of the real numbers that all these uh, sort of systems want to uh, make sure are, are in there. So the members of R are called real numbers. Now, what about the proof? The proof of this theorem is rather long and a bit tedious and is therefore presented in an appendix to chapter one. The proof actually constructs R from Q. Okay, so he's not going to construct R or prove this theorem directly, but there's an appendix to chapter one where we are going to find out about how to do that. Okay, so now here there's an appendix. And in the appendix, theorem 1.19 will be proved in this appendix by constructing R from Q. Rudin is actually going to construct, or at least try to construct, the real numbers from the rationals. He's not going to sidestep the issue or point to somewhere else. He's actually going to try to do it. Okay, so and then there is uh, his construction, which involves step one, step two, step five, up to step nine. Okay, so it's um, quite a, a, a long involved um, argument. So this is seriously uh, an, an attempt. Rudin has actually stepped up to the plate and had a swing at the ball. For sure, he gets a tick in that box. What about this question of whether the definition is satisfactory or not? Well, at this stage, we don't know because we haven't read it. We haven't looked at it carefully. So we'll put a question mark here. And this is definitely a to-do, right? We're going to have to deal with these question marks. 
we're going to have to come back and look carefully at this and see whether it actually works or not. So his uh, approach is that of Dedekind cuts. And this is the last sort of bastion or attempt at constructing real numbers that we have to tackle. Okay? The theory of Dedekind cuts as a way of constructing the real numbers from the rationals. Does it work or not? Well, you will not be surprised to hear that in fact it doesn't work. And in our next video, we're going to start to have a look at why it doesn't. I hope you've enjoyed uh, having a look at uh, these texts with me. Let me emphasize again, even though I may have been harsh uh, on these texts, they are all really excellent texts, otherwise I would not uh, put them in front of you. But we really must not be uh, shirking from the responsibility of really pointing out that there are logical difficulties where there are these logical difficulties. Okay? We cannot pretend that everything is rosy when it's obviously clear, at least from these examples, that things are not all well and good. A lot of these, most of these texts are trying to sidestep the issue or avoid things one way or the other. Of course, there are many other possible calculus texts. There are many other possible analysis texts. And I will probably get another stack of books uh, sometime from the library and go through a similar exercise and show you uh, some more evidence. If you have any favorite books of yours that you would like me to critique, favorite books that you're familiar with, just write them in the comments and I'll see if I can get my hands on them and I will point out the difficulties and real numbers that they share. All of the books will not succeed right, because it's an intractable problem. The real numbers cannot be uh, constructed in the usual uh, kind of fashion. So next time it's Dedekind Cuts that will be uh, on the chopping block. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.